We are now live on Facebook. The event will begin now. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Liz Kruger. I'm the state senator from the 28th district. And joining us today is a special replacement doctor. Um, the Department of Health Commissioner got pulled away by the mayor at the last minute. So he is being replaced by Dr. Easterling, Easterling, yes, first deputy commissioner for the Department of Health, who will be participating in our town hall and playing the role that we were hoping to have Dr. Chokshi play, but I suspect Dr. Easterling is even better at this. So again, thank you for being with us. This will follow the model of most of my town halls, where first we will hear a presentation, and then there will be opportunity for Q&A. Um, there has been an enormous subscription to this uh, town hall. I think close to 900 people pre-signed up. And of course, you can be watching by Facebook, or you can be calling in and listening on the phone. Um, this discussion will be around the COVID vaccines and what is happening. And there are endless questions, and we know that. Before we start today's proceedings, I just want you to be aware that we are very conscious of the fact that things aren't going quite as smoothly and as simply as we were all hoping. And it is an aggravation to us all but that we're going to try to get the best answers we can from our city department of health. And if they don't have the answer today, they will say, we don't have that answer, but they're gonna get us those answers. And if you follow my office, my materials, my town halls, you know that for the entire period we've gone through this pandemic, I have said, we are sticking to science, not politics. And my office is committed to getting you the facts as soon as we have them. So you also know, sometimes we put out notices seven days a week because there have been changes in the science and in the information. And that's what we will continue to do. So sometimes lately, every day, there's a new announcement about who or who is not yet eligible for the vaccines. Every day there is a new announcement about how to apply to get an appointment. Every day there's an announcement of new locations that are distributing vaccines. You don't have to memorize them and know that probably by tomorrow there's some other additional information. So if you don't get my email updates, please make sure to sign up for them. And you can either call my office and give us your email and ask to be added to the list, or you can go on to my, either of my websites, my government website, or just my LizKruger.com website and get added to the email list. Um, but the value is you will then get pretty much daily or every other day updates from my office. If you're not interested, you delete it. I will never know. I will not take any offense no trees were killed. But lately we find out people are reading them carefully every day because there is new information that affects all of our lives. And really nothing is affecting our lives as much as the continuing pandemic and the possibility of us all being able to get vaccinated as soon as humanly possible. We receive incredible volumes of calls every day from constituents with questions and frustrations. We are there to try to help you get answers to your questions. When we don't know, we go hunting until we find out. I want to empathize with you if you've been experiencing difficulty getting the answers to your questions or getting that vaccine that you've been hoping and hoping for for so many months. After dealing with the pandemic for almost a year, we all want to get vaccinated as soon as possible. I understand that. I think that everybody involved is trying to help that happen. Um, but there are a lot of things in the way of a perfect system or a well-organized system, not the least being we need more vaccine. 
but that's also something that happens and changes daily where it's possible there's one or two additional vaccines that may be approved by the FDA very soon, which will also dramatically change um, the access to vaccine in our city and state. The governor estimated right now it will take 14 weeks to vaccinate everyone in groups 1A and 1B. That may mean that you don't get your vaccine until March or April, even if you know that you're in an approved category already. I've provided some information about the vaccine program in my email today. And again, I will continue to provide the updates and informations, information as it becomes available as the, pri as the days go on. And we all hope the process will become smoother and that access will be easier as the days go by. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Easterling to present. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Easterling. Thank you so much, Senator Kruger. Um, uh, I am really, really happy to be the replacement of our commissioner, Dr. David Chosky. Uh, and as Senator Kruger mentioned, uh, he had to join the uh, mayor's of L. Uh, we are certainly uh, continuing to try to update uh, New York City residents on our equitable vaccine distribution plan. And so as we are uh, continuing to uh, put out information, uh, our uh, senior leader officials are always being called at a moment's notice, but really, really happy to be joining you all this afternoon. Uh, and really uh, wanna also thank Senator Kruger for all the work that she is doing uh, to ensure uh, that our constituents are up to date, uh, has awareness. And I think this is really about supporting uh, everyone to make an informed decision about uh, the vaccine, but also ensuring that you have uh, up-to-date information. Uh, so with that, I am going to share my screen uh, so that everyone uh, can sort of see some of the information uh, for today, and then we can go into question and answer. Um, Senator Kruger, can you just confirm you can see my screen? My slide deck? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to do first uh, is sort of just set the table. Uh, and the tone is that we are still in a pandemic, a pandemic uh, that has ravaged communities and families. Uh, and certainly uh, we have all been affected by it. Uh, and even today, uh, you know, on the 14th of January, we are still continuing to see cases go up, uh, hospitalizations go up. Uh, and certainly as cases and hospitalizations go up, uh, then Unfortunately, we also continue to see fatalities. Uh, and, see, and so on the left-hand side, I am showing the percent positivity across New York City. Uh, and really the, the upshot here is that we are seeing cases in all neighborhoods across New York City. Uh, and so it is really important that we do not miss um, the forest for the trees here. Yes, we do have two vaccines and yes, we are on uh, the cusp of having more, uh, but we still need to do everything uh, important and that we know uh, that we'll keep uh, this virus at bay uh, and making sure that individuals are not spreading COVID-19. On the right-hand side, uh, just showing an epi curve and that, and I'm gonna show the full epi curve from the beginning of this pandemic, but essentially uh, you're, you're continuing to see how we are seeing cases go up even now. And so we're tracking uh, the, and monitoring our cases, we're, continue to look at bed availability uh, and, and continue to look at how uh, neighborhoods have access to testing. Um, and so it's important to note that, yes, we are really uh, ensuring that New Yorkers have access to this vaccine, but we have to do everything possible uh, to ensure that we are monitoring uh, this pandemic. Uh, and so here you'll see the full epi curve. Uh, and this curve is starting from the beginning of the pandemic in late February, beginning of March. Uh, and just to note, uh, you know, as the Senator had already mentioned, we are actually coming upon a year. Uh, actually, uh, as we get to Monday, uh, we're going to be uh, sort of at an, uh, an anniversary uh, that unfortunately we will have to celebrate. The first case in the United States actually happened uh, at the beginning of January. And so uh, we're in, in, in New York, that was March 1st. Uh, we uh, identified our first case uh, in New York City. Um, and so this data is available on our website, uh, nyc.gov 
uh, slash uh, COVID-19 and really allowing uh, everyone to really look at their uh, look at their neighborhoods, uh, look at the cases, and very soon we're going to really make this information available uh, even more by neighborhood and really have a data visualization page. And so uh, more to come on how we can really make sure that New Yorkers are informed uh, about uh, the data. And so here's where we are right now. Um, well, before I go there, let me just make sure, you know, really important about uh, stopping the spread uh, of uh, COVID-19. And, you know, I, I think the important part here is, you know, in, individuals have to get tested. Um, we do have our call line 212 COVID-19, where you can speak to a call agent, also speak to a provider to ensure that uh, that information, uh, you know, any questions that you may have uh, is available. Um, but important to follow our core four our prevention strategies. Uh, that, that includes, um, you know, making sure that you're wearing a mask, uh, hand hygiene, ensuring that you're keeping uh, six feet apart from others, uh, and also staying home uh, if you sick. And then also, as I mentioned, getting tested as well. In the beginning of December, our commissioner had put out a health advisory. And that health advisory was really important because I think it's, it's also important that we understand uh, that in order to really slow the spread, in addition to our core four, is that we do need to slow our mobility. And we saw this happen uh, during the spring and March and April. And although uh, we're not uh, moving forward to completely stopping, but limiting our mobility can help slow the spread. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure that uh, our most vulnerable. And so those who are 65 years and older uh, and those uh, who have underlying chronic conditions, that the message was clear through our health advisory that they should uh, limit their mobility and try to stay close to home as possible. But that wasn't just uh, limited to those individuals who are 65 and older, as well as those with underlying chronic conditions, but also to their caregivers, to their family members, because we know uh, that uh, the highest rate of exposure happened between close contacts, uh, individuals who are in, uh, in close quarters, and particularly in, uh, in, in people's homes. And so really ensuring that those who are coming in, in close contact, family members, are trying to limit the exposure uh, from others. Uh, and so um, in, in December, uh, New York City uh, has launched our, our New York City Vaccine for All campaign. Uh, and really ensuring that we are thinking about all the different ways in which New Yorkers can get vaccinated. Um, one of the things that we had launched was our vaccine command center, uh, which is led by our deputy mayor of health and human services, Melanie Hartzog, as well as our commissioner, uh, Dr. David Chosky. Uh, and this is uh, an interagency uh, coordination uh, ensuring that uh, we're bringing and marshalling all of our resources to think about uh, priority groups, to think about our community engagement strategy, to think about how uh, we're leveraging all of our communication channels, uh, but also making sure that our data is informing our operation, operational plan. Uh, and so we're working uh, with our state and our federal partners to ensure uh, that we're clear about uh, the guidance, uh, who is eligible, uh, when are other priority groups coming online, uh, and uh, very clear that the state uh, really sets uh, the criteria for eligibility. Uh, and that is really important. And when uh, Senator Kruger had mentioned another clear component uh, and key component of making sure that we can have a successful uh, vaccine distribution plan is our supply and, and that's at the federal level. And so as we're really looking at those two components uh, at our disposal, we're looking at our capacity and I'll really talk through uh, all the different access points that are coming online and that are coming online in the future as well. Uh, but certainly um, that fourth component of uh, uh, demand, uh, we know the demand is there, but we also understand that there is vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and so as more priority groups are coming online, we are certainly using our communication uh, and our community engagement uh, tools and activities to ensure that we're getting messaging out, information, and so we can address questions questions around science and data uh, to ensure that we're um, supporting individuals making an informed decision about the vaccine. 
And so, as I mentioned, uh, our Vaccine Command Center is uh, an interagency effort, uh, for, uh, including our agency, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our Deputy Mayor's Office, Health and Human Services, and many others, thinking about the, all the different ways that we really have to bring our resources together to really ensure that we can have a successful distribution plan. And even as those challenges have come up, how can we, we be responsive uh, and course correct? Uh, and certainly uh, it has been, uh, you know, really a collective effort, uh, really working across, ensuring that we're working with um, uh, the mayors and the first lady citywide racial inclusion equity task force, thinking about our, our equity plan, uh, working with all of our comms and our city hall uh, folks to ensure that uh, messaging is really getting out. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, data is important. And so we can really think about how are we supporting um, our providers, our pharmacies, federally qualified health centers to ensure that they're also uh, uh, vaccinating as well. Um, and so uh, this is um, a phased approach, uh, given that there is a limited supply of vaccines. Uh, and as you know, in December, uh, phase 1A, uh, that included high-risk healthcare workers uh, and long-term care facility um, uh, staff and residents uh, became eligible. Uh, and as uh, the vaccine distribution plan began to roll out, uh, we started working with our healthcare uh, systems uh, as well as uh, through the uh, federal pharmacy program, supporting our nursing home. And so the initial allocation of 45,000 that came to New York City really went to those two uh, components, our healthcare systems, and then also uh, you know, our long-term care facilities. As we receive more dose and certainly week to week, that changes and really it's up to uh, at the federal level and the state level, how that allocation uh, is really assigned to local jurisdictions. Um, and again, we work with the state to ensure that we understand uh, the guidelines as who is coming online and who begins to be prioritized. And so then it began to open up. And so uh, in addition to high risk healthcare workers, hospitals began to be able to vaccinate additional uh, roles within the hospitals. And so it didn't have to be uh, just high risk healthcare workers and our outpatient physicians, that means your dermatologist, your child's pediatrician, your family and your internal medical doc uh, became eligible and really working with our federally qualified health centers and our providers to ensure that they became vaccinated. And as you know, January 11th, uh, the governor, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, January 8th, the governor announced uh, that our phase 1B uh, would be become eligible. And so that included uh, individuals initially uh, who were 75 and older. And that uh, um, announcement was updated on Monday when it was expanded to 65 and older. But it also included uh, some of our frontline essential workers, public safety officers, uh, thinking about correctional officers, our teachers, transportation. Uh, and so thinking about our access points and ensuring those access points were available was really, really critical. Uh, and really it has been ensuring that our allocation because we still had our hospitals that are vaccinating as well as uh, our long-term care facilities. And so that allocation has been set. And so then also ensuring that these other priority groups are also having access points as well. Uh, and so there you're seeing sort of our phase 1B, but really this goes into how does our capacity really ensure that individuals are being able to uh, get vaccinated. Um, we certainly have other priority groups that have not, um, we have not received confirmation yet. And we continue to work with the state to better understand that, um, including uh, other essential workers uh, as well. Uh, and certainly, uh, as we think about the general population, we do not fall in phase 1A or 1B, uh, which also could include individuals with underlying medical conditions or 1C, you know, uh, sort of thinking about somewhere in mid 2021, uh, where we think that we will have a supply uh, that would really be able to meet the demand of uh, everyone. Uh, and so really thinking about how we're ensuring that we're getting to those uh, who had really disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, our most vulnerable, but then preparing also uh, by mid 2021 to receive enough supply to vaccinate 
um, other groups uh, as well. Um, and so um, we, I know that locations are important. Uh, as I mentioned, capacity is something that uh, we have certainly been thinking about through our vaccine command center. Um, what came online this week uh, was our vaccine finder uh, website. And so you can go to vaccinefinder.nyc.gov. Uh, and really through this portal, you're able to interface with our health and hospital sites, our DOH and aid sites, some of our FQHCs uh, as well, uh, and some of our mega hubs are gonna be uh, listed uh, there as well. Again, limited supply and certainly as we release more appointments, uh, those appointments uh, certainly uh, get snatched up within hours. Uh, and so we're really hoping uh, that as supply becomes more available, that will really allow us to open up uh, more import, uh, appointments. Um, in addition to our website, we also have a hotline uh, where individuals can schedule if they do not choose or want to go uh, on the website. And so through 877, VAX VAX4 NYC. It's 877 VAX4 NYC. And I'm sure this information will be sent out uh, through the proper channels with Senator Kruger's office. Uh, individuals can call in, speak to a call agent, and that call agent will help you schedule. Uh, really important that an appointment is necessary uh, to be able to go to one of the sites. In addition to uh, the appointment, individuals also have to complete a screening form and really important because one, we wanna ensure that you are actually eligible at this time. There are also some really important questions that we have to answer prior to getting vaccinated. Uh, and so those are uh, some of those questions that are on the website uh, that um, if, you, if you go to the website, it will take you through. And we're also looking at ways that we can really support our seniors. Uh, and I know that many caregivers are really supporting uh, their, their, their elderly parents or grandparents to, to get vaccinated, um, but certainly we wanna ensure that our seniors have access uh, to the sites as well. Um, but in addition, we're, we're also continuing to support um, some of the existing infrastructure. So in addition to our city sites, um, we still have hospitals that are, that are uh, vaccinating priority groups, federally qualified health centers as well, in addition to uh, pharmacies that both retail and independent and we're still working with many of our providers, although all community providers have not come online, certainly ensuring that you have access. Our providers have access to the information so they can support their patients to know where they can go to get vaccinated is important as well. Um, but certainly if there are questions, you can call our, our hotline or you can go into our website and there's a lot of information uh, and we certainly wanna make sure the individuals are getting the help that they need. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of the information is there around our testing and core four strategies, uh, getting information and questions answered around uh, our vaccine distribution plan, in addition to the data, you know, just understanding how many vaccines are in New York City at this very moment, uh, as well as how many doses have been administered all on our website. And we really want that transparency to be there and how we're really working uh, to execute this plan. Um, and please, uh, you know, if there are any questions, uh, happy to take them at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Easterling. Oh, yes, we have many questions. Um, so just sticking where you sort of ended with the 1A and 1B and the changing populations being approved. So a lot of the questions we get right now are, what about the people with underlying diseases? people who have diabetes, who have COPD, who may be recovering from cancer and know that they have serious immune deficiencies. Are these people eligible right now? Um, and is that, you know, they can just go and get a, a, a scheduled vaccine now or are we waiting still with them? Yeah, so um, as of this week, uh, the governor did announce that uh, individuals with underlying chronic conditions are eligible. They fall into uh, the um, eligibility criteria to get vaccinated now. Uh, and, you know, I think we're still learning from the state more about proof of eligibility and all the different access points. But what we're doing right now is ensuring that folks do know who's eligible. And a lot of this information is on our website. Um, but certainly um, being able to access uh, and talking to your provider is one, I think is very important. 
lengthy, there is uh, still information uh, that individuals who are immunocompromised, they may be taking immunocompromising agents, uh, you know, even if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, they may have initial questions. And so certainly just speak to their provider, but certainly to the access points, as I mentioned for our city sites, uh, you can go on vaccinefinder.nyc.gov or uh, use our hotline. Uh, and, but then there are some of the providers who do have vaccines as well. Great. And you talked about special needs for seniors, and we certainly hear that and see that in government offices. Seniors are less likely to be able to go online to do the questionnaires and the, re and the searching online. Um, hence, they are much more dependent on phones. It's like we, we appreciate all the languages we need to have in New York City. We sort of need to have a phone call as a language for people who don't have computer access, which are not just seniors, of course. So do we feel like we have enough people who can answer the phone lines that are set up to be the hotline to answer questions and to, to schedule um, vaccines? Or do we need more people in some kind of broader volunteer corps? Um, I think our capacity uh, is really good. I mean, we, we have over 700 call agents available uh, to answer uh, uh, the line at 877-VAX-4NYC. We do have additional call lines as well as our 2012 COVID-19 line. And so we've certainly seen an uptick in the number of calls that we've received through the various call lines that we have. I think the limitation, uh, as you mentioned, is our supply. Uh, and having the supply to be able to open up more appointments uh, is certainly th something that we're really looking at. Um, the, the available appointments that we have right there now are getting snatched up. And so uh, I think that this is uh, certainly important. Um, I think that on the language access, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we've been uh, doing, uh, certainly at our city sites, is trying to match linguistic when someone is coming up uh, to our vaccines, but so, uh, to our sites with someone who speaks uh, the language. So we have some consistency there and really be able to take someone through sort of the experience and explain uh, what the next steps are. Uh, we also have our language line. And so that is uh, available through our schedule hotline when someone calls and actually um, indicates what language that they're speaking. A lot of our posters and our collaterals are actually through that we're using the top 13 languages, but certainly have the ability to expand to more languages as we know that New York City is so diverse and there are over 50 uh, some odd languages that are uh, actually spoken in so many different dialects. And as we get more access to more vaccines, does the city plan on moving to more 24 seven sites so that we can perhaps speed along the number of weeks that it takes to vaccinate everyone? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I know that the mayor has already announced uh, the city field in partnership with the Mets. Uh, that site has not come online yet. That site is going to be slated for January 25th. And so even with our supply concerns now, uh, that 24-7 site, site uh, is slated for the 25th. Uh, and then we're also looking at uh, additional sites as well. So some of us are out there out here are a bit confused because we have city system, state system, the VA has their own system. And I've been told to sell people, if you're a veteran and you're looking for the vaccine, please check with the VA system because they apparently are um, giving out appointments and shots fairly speedily. Um, but someone I fairly well know, and I forget who now, was announcing you should apply everywhere. You should sign up on the state system. You should sign up on the city system and you're gonna get that vaccine somehow. So why not do the in multiple places? What's your opinion about people signing up for appointments in multiple sites? Yeah, I, I know that this is, uh, I know this is a tactic that uh, family members are, are really using. Um, what we try to do to, to really avoid this uh, is try to have uh, all the sites on one place. Uh, and so that's the vaccinefinder.nyc.gov because we list the Jacob Javits Center site, which is a state run site on the website. We have our city sites as well. And then we also have uh, our FQHC sites uh, all listed. Uh, and so I think that is one way that we can ensure that if you go onto our website, you can find one appointment. And so uh, you're not double booking triple booking and taking away a slot from someone else. Um, we certainly recognize uh, that uh, 
people may be double or triple booking. And so we're doing our best uh, to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that uh, we're, we're not wasting any doses as well. And then I, it dawned on me that this was an issue and then I started listening and it really is. So just help me clarify. When you get your first dose, you need to go back to the same place. The same to get Your second dose. Because that correct. way they know that they've completed you and the doses are being distributed correctly. But also you don't want to get version X by a company in your first dose and then get a completely different vaccine for your second dose. That's a bad idea, right? Right. <clears throat> Yeah, so what we're really trying to guard against is uh, making sure that everyone uh, is really getting the second dose matches to the same manufacturer. Uh, we use uh, our citywide immunization registry, which allows us to track uh, that information. And so really making sure that the individual getting the second dose in a timely manner is really what we're trying to guard against in getting that, that second dose, yes. So if I get my vaccine and I get my second dose and I wait another couple of weeks, am I just free and clear to do everything like a person pre-pandemic or do I still have to be careful and why? Yeah, uh, no, great, really great question, Senator Kruger. Um, so after the first dose, and I think this is really, really important and why is a two dose series for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. So after the first dose, uh, yes, you achieve some level of immunity, but it is not the full 94, 95% that has been advertised. It's about 51, 52%. And so taking the first dose uh, affords some immunity, but your risk is still uh, high, uh, just not as high as the general public. And so taking the second dose is really, really important. Once you take the second dose, uh, and so as soon as that day you take the second dose, you do not achieve the full immunity. And so that's why you really have to wait until uh, two weeks to really have the full immunity. But it's also important, so that's one, right? You wanna make sure that you achieve the full immunity. That's one series, that's not a booster. That's just one series. And it's as if you were taking the flu vaccine, if that only requires one shot, you can achieve about 90% immunity against influenza A and B or whichever uh, is high that year. So this is a two dose series and that's one vaccine. A booster really lets you know if there's waning immunity or immunity is lost. So over time, you need to take a booster series. Unfortunately, there's no information that's out there yet. So we still have more to learn about the immunity level and able to maintain over a period of time. And so we really encourage individuals to make sure that they still wearing their masks and doing all the things uh, that is necessary uh, to make sure that they're protecting their loved ones. And protecting your loved ones, even though you have taken the vaccine uh, and say two weeks have passed and you have now 94, 95% immunity, you still have uh, are at risk of transmitting it to someone who is also, who have not taken the vaccine. And so really important that we're all still wearing our masks and doing all the things that we're doing now uh, to be vigilant against keeping this at bay. Okay. Um, so now we've had enough people vaccinated that we've seen that there are some common um, short-term side effects. Can you let people know what they are so that they don't have to panic if they get the vaccine and suddenly X happens to them? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important to know that this, you know, both vaccines have gone through uh, a number of different clinical trials. There are three phases of the clinical trial. Phase four is really the post monitoring as uh, we're going through right now for both Moderna and Pfizer. So hundreds of thousands of individuals uh, have taken the vaccine. Uh, and what we've learned so far from individuals who participated both in the clinical trial and those who are uh, getting the vaccine now, uh, some of the common uh, side effects. Uh, the most common uh, is pain at the injection site. There's some soreness uh, in the arm after you're vaccinated that typically uh, wears off in about 24 or 48 hours. Uh, other common side effects include fatigue, uh, low grade fever, uh, or a uh, headache, uh, but this is less common uh, and, and not uh, reported as much. And we continue to monitor um, you know, some of the side effects that do happen. And those are common, but the most common again is uh, pain at the injection site. Uh, but what you know, we've been hearing and seeing at our, at our sites is that folks uh, are not experiencing any symptoms. 
um, the most severe uh, comment uh, or most severe side effect that we've seen uh, is uh, anaphylaxis reaction uh, to uh, the vaccine. Uh, and so it is our common practice, uh, both in hospitals and pharmacies and even our city sites, um, that every individual who comes to is vaccinated, they sit in a wait for about 15 to 20 minutes. They are observed by a clinician. Uh, and once it's documented that there has no, been no reaction uh, to uh, the vaccine, they're able to leave or discharge, as we say in the healthcare system jargon. Uh, but, you know, certainly it has happened. Uh, and it is, um, uh, so it's not something to, to ignore. And these are some of the questions that we asked prior uh, to vaccinating someone to make sure that we can prevent an anaphylaxis reaction. If it does happen, um, certainly uh, it is something that is concerning because your respiratory uh, system can uh, be compromised and not able to breathe. And so we do have clinicians on site uh, who are prepared to either inject epinephrine uh, to ensure that someone is taken care of, and we immediately um, uh, call an ambulance that is, on, that is on site. So certainly we are prepared, but we uh, we're not seeing uh, these very severe reactions happen. All right. So if you are a person who has a history of needing an ep an EpiPen with you, um, obviously you should be telling whoever is going to give you the vaccine that. Should you bring your EpiPen with you when you're getting vaccinated, just in case? Just in case, it's fine to bring it, but we are we have it on site at every location as well, as well as uh, clinicians and ambulance EMTs are on site. Great. So we're New Yorkers and some of us get older and we're on quite a few prescription drugs. And we are familiar with being told that there are interactions between different drugs. Are there any specific drugs that we need to make sure we are telling someone about um, if we're going to get vaccinated, maybe they would say, don't take the drug for a couple of days. Is there sort of a list somewhere like that? No, um, just, and I've been looking at this, uh, certainly both um, for medical uh, contraindications, but also for pharmaceutical contraindications. Um, I think that this is where uh, more data is needed um, to know about some of the contraindications for medications, uh, but nothing uh, that uh, we need to communicate right now. I think we, we absolutely need to continue to monitor this, but right now, uh, nothing, no major contraindications to any medications, uh, but certainly I think it's always important uh, as I share that we should speak to your physician uh, so that they're aware uh, that you're prepared to take the vaccine uh, which I think is really important. Great. So, you know, the bad news is quite a few of us have already had COVID. Are we still supposed to get vaccinated or are we okay already? Absolutely. Um, if you, if, if someone has been uh, exposed or infected uh, 90 days ago, three months ago, four months ago, uh, they should certainly uh, plan to get vaccinated. Um, the, the point I, I do want to just make is that if you are currently experiencing an infection, uh, you were recently tested two days ago, four days ago, or you had, you had known exposure very recently, uh, you should complete your isolation uh, or your quarantine uh, practice first to 10 days, full 10 days before you go into any of the sites. Because these are in close quarters, you're going into a hospital, you know, just like any, any of these guidelines that we know to be put in place, um, you want to make sure that you complete your isolation and quarantine practice. And I know that these vaccines are not recommended for children, but define the age of when you're too young to get these vaccinations. Absolutely. So for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, Pfizer is available for any individual that is 16 years and older. So if actually you're 16 on the day that you um, are, are vaccinated, you are eligible. Uh, and for the Moderna vaccine, it is 18 years of age and older. Uh, and so, you know, this is certainly something uh, that I'm paying close attention. Uh, I have a 10 month old daughter uh, and certainly want to keep her protected, uh, but the data isn't there yet. Uh, and the science uh, is still, uh, still uncovering. Uh, and I know that they have been recruiting manufacturers, drug manufacturers have been recruiting uh, for the clinical trials for, uh, for, for children. And so this is still underway. And so we're some, some time away before uh, we will know 
uh, when the vaccine will be approved for children. Thank you. So there are lots of New York City residents who are spending their time or even months away from the city. Some of them are at a second home somewhere in the state of New York. Some of them are in different states. Um, can you go ahead and get vaccinated somewhere else if you define yourself as a legal resident of New York City? Yeah, so this is this. I think this is going to depend on uh, the jurisdiction uh, that you're in. Um, I think some of this is we're still learning more from the state about uh, res residency requirement. Um, I know that uh, you know the the governor has put out an alert, uh, you know, encouraging New Yorkers to make sure they're going onto the website to get vaccinated. Uh, we're certainly paying attention to uh, the state guidance, and so I will say that any individual. Uh, that is out of state at this point um, should certainly check with the uh, regulations for that jurisdiction. Um, what we've seen here is that a lot of the individuals who are getting vaccinated are from uh, New York City, uh, but we also know that there are a lot of individuals who work in New York City who may live in Connecticut or Long Island or New Jersey, uh, and they're certainly also getting vaccinated as well. And so really it's based on um, your employer, and so oftentimes uh, employers are vaccinating individuals regardless of their residency. Okay. So what about homebound seniors? They can't stand in line. They can't get over to City Field realistically um, or the Javits Center. Is there going to be some system for being able to vaccinate people who are homebound? The, the short answer is yes. Um, we have been thinking about this uh, we, we anticipate that there's somewhere between three to 10,000 uh, uh, older adults who are homebound. Uh, and um, and this, that does not include individuals who are in long-term care facilities. And so uh, what we've been thinking about uh, is a couple of things. One, uh, we wanna make sure that individuals know uh, the information uh, with, about scheduling and ensuring that they have access to uh, where they can get vaccinated. Uh, two, what we've been thinking through uh, are transportation issues, uh, transportation resources, uh, and we're making transportation available uh, for our seniors. Uh, and then three, we do know that there is some sub subset of that population uh, who, as you mentioned, will not be able to leave their home, uh, be able to come down and get vaccinated. So really thinking through a plan of how we bring uh, the vaccines uh, as close uh, to them as possible. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're really thinking through uh, all the logistics as we work with our, our federal government partners to understand the, the ability to, uh, to really carry and transport the vaccine. That is very, very important. We do not want to uh, compromise the vaccine at all uh, through transportation. So that's what we're just thinking through. Okay. Um, so we, you, you touched on the fact that essential workers and frontline workers are supposed to be eligible, but there's like endless questions about, is somebody one of those? I mean, the guys at the parking garage said to me, we were told we should be essential workers. Certainly the guys and women who are working in food stores selling us food every day, I get notes and calls from people who are social workers doing case management work in our shelter systems, in our senior centers. I mean, is there a master list somewhere that I can direct people to so they actually know whether they fit some criteria of, of actual eligibility? Uh, absolutely, and I'm, and I'm sure that you've been sharing this information. Um, we have been following uh, the guidance set by the state. And so it's on their website uh, and we, really are just crosswalking that same information and putting it on our site as well. Um, and so we defer to the state. Uh, this is one of those questions where I really have to defer to our state colleagues uh, as they are outlining the priority groups. Uh, we work with them to really understand and we're getting these questions as well, uh, who falls under what category. Um, and so I think this is, uh, you know, uh, certainly a challenge uh, to some degree uh, as, you know, all these questions, we may not have immediate answers, uh, but, but we're really working with our state colleagues to do that. And I think the confusion is there's so much gray area there. So for example, the next question is a classic. 
um, and very common question. The caregivers of homebound elderly sick people. Yep. Sometimes they're their children or their other relatives. So am I a caregiver and hence in that category or am I simply an adult who's related to a senior who I take care of and therefore am not defined as a caregiver? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I do not have the answer to that. Uh, that is a question that I, I, I get almost every briefing. Okay. Um, and I look at the, the guidance set by the state and it clearly states um, uh, personal aides, uh, caregiver. And you know, I, I interpret that language uh, as anyone, someone who is taking care uh, of an older adult or someone who uh, you know, could be having uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, and that could be a loved one, a family member. So uh, I, I totally agree with you, uh, but uh, I do have the diversity to defer to the state on that. Right. Certainly when you just think it out, you say, well, those are the last people we want to end up in the hospital needing round the clock care or in a nursing home at this time. So we really do want to make sure they don't get sick and their family members don't get sick, hence can't continue to take care of them. You know, so again, it feels to me like it's not supposed to be gray area, but I know that that is still gray area out there. And that's why I asked you, because I was going to put you on the spot that you have the same problem I do, being able to get people help for that. Yeah. Um, yes. So we will continue to push the state. And trust me, people, if you're listening and you're frustrated, any recommendations you'd like to make to my office to push hard on the state and or the city and or anyone else, we will do so. Um, we are revved up to represent you to get the best answers. We all need these answers. Okay, we just have a few more minutes left. And I see the commissioner has joined us. Oh, oh, hello, thank you. I'm so busy reading my questions. Hello, commissioner. Hi, Senator Kruger. Please accept my apologies for, um, for not being able to join for the whole session. I left you in great hands with Dr. Easterling, uh, but I wanted to join for the last few minutes at least. Well, thank you. And you did leave us in very good hands. And since the mayor demanded your attention, I can't really be upset with you. I hope he used you effectively um, since he stole you from us. We, we just wrapped up a press conference. And if I may just say one, one thing, you use the phrase revved up. And I, I wanna make sure that you and your constituents know how revved up I, Dr. Easterling, the whole health department are for this historic vaccination campaign. It's the single most important thing that we can do to save lives uh, this year. And so we're pulling out all the stops. Exactly, and we want to do everything we can, speaking for myself and my government colleagues to help you. So my all the senators met today and everybody was revved up and basically was comparing notes from around the state. The frustrations are high everywhere. Um, the confusion is high everywhere. And the demands by people just get us the vaccine, please, please, please. You know, and, and I get it. We can only get it produced in such and such time and only get it still delivered. But none of us really believe the federal government has done enough or done what they could have done. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility for taking care of New Yorkers falls to us here in New York. So, you know, it only goes so far to be able to say, you know, we didn't get what we needed from the federal government, but we just need to figure out, you know, how to get more vaccines in more distribution hands as quickly as possible. Um, so you came in just when I was going to ask you, um, let's see, maybe the last question. Um, how, is there a way that I get notified once I've signed up for all, all these, I filled out the form, I signed up for either online or on the phone, and then I just wait, and what am I waiting for? Um, let me make sure I'm following the, the question as well, meaning after you've scheduled an appointment? Yes, or you may have, yes. I mean, in some places they take your information and they say they'll get back to you. So is that, 
you know, and we talked a little bit about people are going multiple places to get appointments because whatever, whoever comes through first, they'll use. And then supposedly there's a centralized way to ensure that you really are only getting one appointment for your one vaccine. But are you supposed to just hear back from that same centralized site that you reached out to, or it might be somebody else getting back to you? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is that um, everyone should only make one appointment, you know, particularly when we do have uh, a limited supply of vaccine and, and you know, growingly uh, very limited appointments because of that limited supply. Um, anyone who's booking two or three appointments uh, means that you're um, you're taking up you know someone else's uh, place in line. So I, I do want to make that part of it clear. I also do want to acknowledge that um, in some cases, again, because of the limited supply that we have from the federal government, um, people may not be able to get uh, an appointment. You know where you call or where you navigate to, or even at you know at one of our city sites. We're working every day to expand those number of slots, um, you know, as soon as we get additional supply from the federal government. So uh, in some cases, people will get back in touch with you to say, hey, we've got open slots now, you know, come back and book one. Um, in, uh, in other cases, you know, people do have to check back uh, for what the most convenient place is for them to go and get vaccinated. And so we talked a bit before about the city system, the state system. I threw in that I knew the VA was making um, vaccines available to vets, but then we hear vaguely about this whole giant national CVS, Walgreen, Rite Aid system. Can you help us understand, is that happening in New York now, in the future? What are we supposed to know about that? That's a great question. Thank you for, um, for raising it. Uh, the short answer is, is yes. Um, we as a city, uh, have activated those federal programs that are partnerships with CVS and Walgreens um, to be uh, to be vaccinating on the first possible day that they can vaccinate. Uh, so we started that um, back in December for the program that is helping with nursing home residents and staff, uh, and that has already vaccinated thousands of people, some of our most you know vulnerable individuals in terms of nursing home residents and then the staff who are taking care of them, which also affords protection for them. Um, going forward, there is a, a related federal program working with CVS, Walgreens, and other pharmacies that will make uh, vaccination much more broadly available through retail pharmacies, you know, the one that you have around the corner from wherever you live. Um, that will require more supply from the federal government, you know, to actually be able to flow to those pharmacies. Uh, and what we're hearing is that, um, you know, that will really begin in earnest, uh, we hope later this month, um, and then ramp up from there. Until then, the city is certainly not, you know, waiting around for, uh, for the federal government and those pharmacies. That's why we've stood up, uh, you know, um, dozens of access points just in the last week alone uh, to get as many shots in arms as possible. Thank you. And I guess the last question, do you have to pay anything for these vaccines? Do you need to bring your insurance card? Are you going to get billed? How does that work? Um, the, the vaccine is, um, is safe and free for the individual. Uh, in, in some cases, yes, um, you know, if you do have health insurance, they will collect your uh, insurance information in order to bill your insurer, but that cost should not be passed along to the individual. That's been the commitment from the federal government, um, and you know that should be the case for everyone who gets vaccinated. So the bottom line is, for a person, uh, these these shots are free uh, as well as being safe and effective. And I know this, but it didn't come up today, so I'll just mention it. If you're not legally here and you don't have paperwork, that should not stop you from going somewhere to get vaccinated, right? Correct. We, um, we care uh, deeply about uh, undocumented immigrants uh, and their health. Uh, and part of that is, um, is with respect to COVID-19 vaccination as well. So, uh, so yes, that is not a barrier to getting vaccinated. Okay. Well, we, we've literally run out of time. So I, I want to thank you for jumping on at the end. I want to tell you that Dr. Easterling did a 
fabulous job in your absence. Um, we had more questions than we could possibly have covered, but we got through a huge amount of them. And there's information about how to follow up um, through the various phone numbers and hotlines and websites. And again, anyone who gets my materials um, will get on a daily basis updated information about everything COVID-19 and the newest, most helpful science about how to take care of this. I wanna thank both gentlemen. I wanna thank everybody who participated. I always wanna thank my staff for being the best staff in government. And our next scheduled event will take place next Thursday, January 21st from 10 a.m. to 11.30. And this is the first session of our morning senior roundtable series. We used to do it in person, but you know now everyone's doing Zoom. So you bring your own coffee and bagel instead of my offering it to you, I apologize. Um, the discussion will focus on palliative and hospice care. And our presenters will include Dr. Sean Morrison, who is the chair of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at Mount Sinai. Until then, remember, stay safe, protect yourself and others. If you have to go out, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, patiently wait until you're eligible to get that vaccine, but then sign up and get it as soon as possible. So again, for everyone, thank you so much.